once again, uh, we welcome you to this activity, which is a noble cause for celebrating the World Press Freedom Day. We thank everyone who has turned up. We also thank the different stakeholders that have been involved in arranging this event. Uh, Uganda Human Rights Commission, uh, some civil society groups uh, where my sister Charita in the Kivo is, uh, the UN agencies, and many other stakeholders. We thank you for your efforts uh, for organizing this activity for us, the journalists. President Kabineta, the country representative, UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, the interim executive of the Uganda Media Sector Working Group, the media fraternity, human rights defenders, ladies and gentlemen, I have the pleasure to welcome you all to this public dialogue on World Press Freedom Day 2022, organized with support from the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. The Uganda Human Rights Commission is happy to be associated with this public dialogue, which is seeking to interrogate the impact of the internet and other technologies on promotion and protection of human rights. In particular, the focus on freedom of the press and other media, which is a facet of freedom of speech and expression, is key to the Commission's work of protection and promotion of human rights in Uganda, since it underpins all other rights and freedoms. By now, most of us if not all, 
aware of the effects of the digital revolution, not only on enjoyment of human rights, but also on the duty of the state to respect, protect, and fulfill them. The effects are both positive and negative, and so we must find ways of promoting what enhances the enjoyment of the rights and the freedoms in question, as we also recommend action to address the negative consequences. The need to protect journalism and media freedom, which are the enablers of freedom of speech and expression, cannot be overemphasized. The Uganda Human Rights Commission is looking forward to your recommendations. I want to pledge on behalf of the Commission to carry them forward so that duty bearers and rights holders can take the necessary action. UN resident coordinator for her personal presence here. Thank you for gracing uh, this day. We are very grateful. Uh, so friends, uh, I now have
circumstances of the digital age. And so, uh, as, as Moses um, did indicate, as the Uganda media sector working group, uh, we, we are, is the, the, the Uganda media sector working group is a platform uh, that seeks to harmonize our voices as media practitioners to be able to respond uh, to the challenges of our practice today. And as you know, uh, oftentimes uh, it is, there, is, there is a temptation to think about media as being a concern for journalists. But as we know, if we look at the media as an ecosystem, journalism occupies just one, probably even the smallest component of that ecosystem. So there is the public, there are media consumers, there are news consumers, there are media producers, all these actors, you know, whether they are operating within state agencies or non-state agencies or media support organizations, training institutions, all these have a stake in the media sector. And so the whole idea why, for instance, the Uganda Media Sector Working Group uh, is being formed and then the process started like two years ago and we'll have an opportunity to introduce even more to you is to harmonize all these voices so that we can have a platform where we can address uh, all these issues uh, from a common standpoint and build consensus really about where the industry should be going, where the sector should be going, but most importantly including the voices of the consumers of news, of the producers of content who don't operate in corporate or institutional media, but people who have access to the, to the, to the technology that we have today. And so the main concern uh, or the main challenge as you might, uh, as, 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 you might uh, as, as, as the discussions have been going on uh, is that uh, in our digital uh, era today, the way we perceive, the way we produce and the way we consume news and information has changed dramatically. And so one of the key issues uh, that confronts us today is that, for instance, today the, the law that we have today that governs the practice of journalism is a law that was established in 1995. Now that law, as you can imagine, is, 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 is so outdated that uh, the regulators actually struggle to regulate the sector because the law does not and the regulations that were conceived for a very different era, a very different generation, you know, the circumstances have, have changed. And so that is the kind of conversation that I believe, uh, that we believe as the Uganda Media Sector Working Group, working together with the UN agencies, with all the other, you know, stakeholders, the Parliamentary Press Association, the Uganda Journalists Association, and all the other actors that we can really, really uh, marshal our voice uh, and, and, and contribute ideas to how best the sector should be governed governed internally but also externally because I think the challenges that we are talking about are not just external challenges to the media sector or to the media industry. They are also serious internal challenges and many times we think about the challenges from outside and forget about the challenges within our own practice internally. And, and, that is, and, and that is a conversation uh, that we also must have, and we must have a, a sober conversa conversation, uh, a conversation uh, that is based on mutual respect. And, and, and therefore, uh, I, I, I would like to, to, um, uh, to, to reiterate uh, that uh, as we go forward, uh, as we celebrate uh, the, the, the theme, uh, as, we, as we commemorate World Press Freedom Day this year under the theme Journalism and uh, Digital Sage, we would like uh, to have uh, you know, the, the voices of all those you know, who are affected by what we do as the media. There are many people who are aggrieved, you know, regular citizens, people in positions of authority, even media practitioners themselves, for instance, there are a lot of issues of welfare that I know the Uganda Human Rights Commission has been working on for quite some time, issues of the welfare of media practitioners, especially uh, people who are working in the news industry. So those are all issues uh, that we need to engage with media owners, with media pro proprietors, people who invest in media uh, to have uh, a discussion about how best uh, to, to address all those 
those issues because if you don't address issues of welfare, for instance, we cannot attract and retain the best talent in the media industry. And as you know, on a day to day basis, the average citizen reside, uh, uh, relies on information to be able to make decisions about their lives, whether decisions about health, decisions about you know consumption, decisions about health. So if the people who routinely produce that information are not motivated to do the best job that they can do, then I think we have a problem. Uh, and that is why uh, uh, this year's theme, uh, journalism under digital siege that we are, that we are commemorating today, uh, is a very important one and, 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 and would like to, uh, uh, to, to and, and we, uh, we are glad uh, to participate uh, and we look forward to continue engaging with all partners within the UN system, uh, within the government, starting with the Uganda Human Rights Commission and we've really had an engagement, you know, uh, with uh, uh, Justice Wangadia and her team and we are looking forward uh, as media uh, practitioners, as, as media leaders, you know, across the board Consumers, producers, owners of media platforms, we look forward to having uh, 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 this kind of dialogue. And, and, and this is, I believe, is just the beginning, just the first dialogue, but there are going to be many dialogues of this nature uh, over the years. Uh, thank you, uh, and, 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 and I wish uh, all of us successful deliberations. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lugalambi. Dr. Lugalambi is, uh, is from the academia, and uh, those are key stakeholders that we need uh, in, in, in promoting uh, press freedom and developing the media industry in the country. Um, right now, According to the program, we are supposed to have remarks from Robert Kochan, the country representative for the United Nations Human Rights. No sanitizing anymore. <laughs> Do we have? In Queensland. We should have. We should we have should have. charity. Can we get some sanitizer? There's actually a second mic. The State uh, Minister of ICT and National Law Guidance, the Chairperson of the Uganda Human Rights Commission, my dear sister Miriam Maria Wangadia, the United Nations Resident Coordinator, Sister Susan Ngongi Namondo, the Interim Co Coordinator, Uganda Media Sector Working Group, Dr. George William Lugal Lugalambi, Distinguished representative of government. Yes. Yes, let us have it here. Distinguished representative of government ministries, agencies, and departments. Representative of the private sector. And this one, okay. Representative of the private sector and civil society organizations. Members of the media fraternity. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. On behalf of the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, commonly called also UN Human Rights in Uganda, 
I am delighted to be part of this public dialogue to commemorate the World Press Freedom Day under the theme, Journalists Under Digital Siege. I wish to express our solidarity with all stakeholders and to renew our commitment as the UN Human Rights Office in Uganda to work with government, development partners, civil society organizations, the media, and other relevant actors to highlight how to address challenges to journalism in this country in a more effective manner. In October 2020, the Human Rights Council of the UN expressed deep concern on the safety of journalists. The Council noted that throughout the world, the work of journalists and media workers often puts them at special risks of human rights violations and abuses, including killing, torture, and forced appearance, arbitrary arrest, arbitrary detention, arbitrary expulsion, physical and sexual violence, to name just a few, as well as intimidation, threats, and harassment of all kinds, including by targeting their families, members, and ab or arbitrary raiding and searching their residency, which often deters journalists from continuing their work or encourages self-censorship, consequently depriving society of important information. In Uganda, the Human Rights Network for Journalists Uganda has reported journalists being beaten, arrested, and detained, including in communicado detentions and confiscation of their tools of trade, such as cameras, audio recorders, and other gadgets. These acts, which are generally perpetrated in total impunity, threaten press freedom, particularly online media. At UN Human Rights, we support national level efforts aimed at building the capacities of media professionals and at saving journalists from digital siege. And we call on everyone who has a role to play, including media owners and managers, journalists, freelancers, or otherwise, the regulators, judiciary, as well as the law enforcement officers, among others to support and promote professional journalism founded on independent news media institutions. However, many challenges face journalists as a profession and journalists as frontliners. While the profession faces challenges of policy and regulations, I heard the call that the welfare of journalists have to be taken into account, and I think that's the legitimate one. Such challenges that tend to restrict and put media freedom under siege, the impact is more on the journalist himself or herself. In the wake of COVID-19, for, for, for instance, management of media entities, including TV stations and some of the print media, closed some of the outlets in order to keep afront in the business. Journalists lost their jobs and sources of income, which adversely affected their livelihood. Ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, as we commemorate today, World Press Freedom Day, I wish to call upon the media practitioners and journalists to uphold values of professionalism and to encourage constructively and to engage constructively in dialogue on the apparent intolerance by government with media on freedoms of expression, the clampdown on social media, and all online practitioners and on the exercise excesses of security agencies, arbitrary arrest and torture of journalists. The UN Human Rights Office remains available to facilitate such dialogue.
I heard there was a petition that was uh, sent to security officers on uh, alleged human rights violations affecting journalists, which was left unattended. I pledge support in facilitating dialogue with security officers, and I will really be happy to engage further with relevant actors in furthering that discourse. As I conclude, I would like to join my big sister, the chairperson of the Uganda Human Rights Commission, to reiterate our strong commitment to continue working tirelessly with governments, development partners, civil society, and media for a transformed and prosperous Uganda, where journalism is not a crime and press freedom is a right and not a privilege. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency uh, Robert Kochan. Uh, by the way, something very brief. According to the latest report of the World Press Freedom Index, of, uh, Uganda's position actually has worsened. We've moved from position 117 to position 125. So the different stakeholders who are here, uh, let's take this seriously and come up with measures to ensure that uh, we reverse that trend because it looks like the situation keeps worsening. Um, According to the program, we are supposed to have a minister from the Ministry of ICT. By the way, one of the reasons why we have so many challenges as the media industry is that uh, it looks like we are on our own. This is supposed to be our mother ministry. But do we have a representative from the ministry here? This is supposed to be our mother ministry, but uh, they always um, shun our different activities that we prepare. In parliament there, I usually see ministries presenting statements which are debated on different international days, and we have never seen the minister for ICT presenting a statement on the World Press Freedom Day. Um, you, you can imagine. So. According to this program, we are supposed to have uh, the Minister for ICT, Dr. Chris Padiomusi. I had been told that uh, the State Minister, uh, Baluku, the State Minister for National Guidance was supposed to be coming here to represent him. I don't know whether he's around, but he's, if he's not around, when he comes, we shall give him an opportunity to speak to us. So, according to the program, okay, sorry, uh, we, I have been actually corrected. We, before the minister, we are supposed to have the, the UN boss in Uganda, who is already here, but after her, of course, we are supposed to have uh, remarks from the minister. So without wasting any more time, ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome uh, Ms. Susan Ngongi Namondo, the UN resident coordinator, to speak to us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, I was going to start by recognizing the Honorable Minister that we expected to come, but you've practically told us we shouldn't expect him. So recognizing whoever will be representing the Ministry of ICT and National Guidance. Um, the Chairperson of Uganda Human Rights Commission, the coordinator of the Uganda Media Sector Working Group and the media more broadly present today, representatives of the private sector and civil society organizations, 
Welcome, Honorable. Thank you. Um, the UN Human Rights Country Representative and all my UN colleagues who may be present, ladies and gentlemen, including those who are at home, good morning to everybody. To work, sticking with the theme, to work as a journalist today, one needs a great deal of courage. Hundreds of journalists, photographers, camera operators, the world over have suffered a lot of abuse. They have been killed, injured, jailed, and threatened. And this is a really worrying global trend. And this is a trend that we also see on our continent. And you mentioned the um, Press Freedom Index. It appears also in Uganda. As was already mentioned by the human rights, um, um, the chairperson of the Human Rights Commission, a free, safe, independent, and pluralistic press is a core element of any functioning democracy because it supports the protection of all the other human rights. Instances where public has learned of where there might have been abuse of misuse of power, corruption, um, torture, other other and other um, um, and other such such um, instances have really been the work. A lot of it has come to light because of the courage, courageous work of journalists. Press freedom is an acknowledged human right enshrined both in national and international law, in particular the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and, and the Convention of Human Rights, which also protects the physical integrity of journalists. On behalf of the United Nations system in Uganda, let me express our solidarity with all journalists and renew our commitment to work with all the stakeholders, the government, our development partners, civil society, the professional media organizations, and journalist associations towards a safe and secure working environment for journalists. I think as was mentioned by Dr. Um, Mugalabi, I hope I'm not mispronouncing your name hugely. The world today has changed significantly since we started celebrating this day in 1993. In 1993, barely any of us here present, those online, had a functioning email address. There was no Google, no Facebook, no Twitter. We didn't have citizen journalists in the, quite the same way we have them today. The widespread diffusion of the internet, mobile communication, digital media, and a variety of social software tools throughout the world has transformed the communication system into an interactive horizontal networks that connect with local, connect the local and global. New forms of media cater for the flow of messages from many to many. It used to be from a few to many, now it's many to many. They have provided alternative mediums of citizen communication and participatory journalism. And with the growth of digital journalism and digital tools, we now have new opportunities and threats to both our democracies and journalists. The opportunities of the internet, and I think the chairperson also mentioned this, I think I generally agreed upon. The internet has economically by companies and individuals. Remember allegations against a certain consulting firm in Europe that amassed, analyzed, and exploited Facebook data to help individuals and groups politically. And that also happens more or less the same technology is used to manipulate us to buy all sorts of things. We buy particular brands of soap, diapers, etc., based on how this technology is being used to influence us. Other threats, 
And for me personally, just my own plug, I don't think we talk about that particular threat enough. How the use of the internet is used to shrink our space, to shrink choices. And this is choices across the board. And I think this is something that really is worthy of greater um, um, debates um, so that we can all more be aware and find ways of protecting ourselves, especially our children, who don't sometimes have the sophistication when they go into some of these spaces. Other threats have directly targeted the safety and security of journalists, especially female journalists. As a re result, these threats tend to silence some journalists' voices. I believe um, Robert just spoke about that. And deplete freedom of speech by interrupting valuable um, um, investigative work. This dialogue is really critical. We need more of these sorts of dialogues to look at the various issues that have been raised already, looking at the legislative framework as was raised by the professor, um, looking at how we build a culture um, that condemns violence against journalists, looking at how we deal with the issues of impunity that has already come up, and looking at how we deal with educating ourselves and educating the, um, um, the population. The media plays a key role in education. And a lot of our political democracies are still young, they're still fragile. Um, if I may be so blunt, in some parts of the world you can still buy a vote. In such an environment, education is truly critical. We also need to better um, ideas on how we better tackle online violence of journalists, especially female journalists, including awareness raising on safety on, for online journalists. And for that to effectively happen, we need to see more women also take up leadership positions in media organizations. Um, those who are usually most concerned by a particular problem need to also sit at the leadership level when these things are being discussed to be able to support and provide ideas in terms of going forward. And we need greater, greater collaboration, and I think this came out clearly, greater collaboration between all stakeholders of the media. As I conclude, on behalf of the United Nations in Uganda, I reiterate the support that has already been mentioned by Robert. I reiterate our commitment to continue working with the government, her development partners, civil society and media organizations, and journalist associations towards a safe and secure working environment through implement, the implementation of the UN Sustainable Development Cooperation Framework, our global framework, in support of the third national development plan and vision 2040 to transform Uganda to that dream um, 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 that it aspires to be. Thank you all for your attention and best wishes to all for this dialogue. Thank you very much, Susan. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, after Susan, we are supposed to have uh, the Honorable Minister for ICT was already uh, arrived. But Honorable Minister, before you come in, uh, actually before you came in, we had informed the members that Uganda's ranking, uh, as far as press freedom is concerned, has worsened. The latest report of World Press Freedom Index indicates that uh, Uganda has moved from position 117 to position 125. And according to all the reports uh, over the years that we have in Uganda, including from Uganda Human Rights Commission. Uh, the leading violators of press freedom in Uganda are actually state entities that include the uh, Uganda Police Force, UPDF, UCC, RDCs. And uh, these things have been happening over the years and we've been raising our voices, but uh, the situation just keeps uh, worsening. We know you are a new minister in that ministry, but uh, in the past we've not been having, uh, we've not been getting a lot of support from that ministry. Yet the Ministry for ICT and National Guidance is supposed to be our mother ministry, and it is supposed to help us in having engagements 
uh, with these different actors that continue to violate press freedom with impunity. So we humbly request you to undertake some new measures uh, to help us end this trend because the situation keeps worsening. Uh, on that note, I would like to welcome you, Honorable Minister uh, Godfrey Baluk Kukabianga, who is the State Minister for National Guidance, to come and speak to us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to apologize for coming late. It's not my nature. I always keep time, but there were a few disruptions here and there. And I also bring apologies from my senior minister, the Honorable Dr. Chris Mariumusi, who was supposed to officiate at this uh, function, but uh, he was uh, called for an abrupt meeting in Entebbe, and uh, he delegated me to come and uh, step in for him. So his apologies. My name is Kabianga Godfrey Baruku. I'm the Minister of State for National Guidance in the Ministry of Information, Communication Technology, and National Guidance. It's a great honor to join you today to co commemorate the World Press Freedom Day. I would like to thank the Uganda Human Rights Commission, the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights in Uganda, and the Uganda Media Sector Working Group for organizing this important dialogue. The right to express, the right to know, and the right to safety are fundamental pillars of good governance, which in Uganda are enshrined in Articles 29 and 41 and others of the Constitution, which is our supreme law. Government has also put in place several other laws like Access to Information Act, with attendant guidelines to operationalize these rights. This is because government believes an informed population is a manageable population. The fourth estate, where most of you belong, is a very, very important arm in social economic transformation of a nation. The fourth estate can disrupt economic transformation or it can shape it. So you are very, very an important arm in the governance of this country. We are automatically celebrating World Freedom Day at a time where so many media forms, new forms of media are emerging, and where everybody has become a journalist. I think some of us who didn't study journalism now, we don't even know the definition. As if everybody has become a journalist in his own way. We who regulate media have a problem. You even find an online newspaper, an online TV, and an online radio, which are not even licensed, and they are transmitting information. That's where the world is. It's moving digital, and everything is becoming very, very complex. Doubtless, we are all aware that social media has caused dis disruptions to how traditional media gathered, filtered news for purposes of influencing social, economic, and political happenings 
in our society. The digital era has transferred greater portions of journalism activity to the internet via micro blog sites such as Twitter, messaging sites such as WhatsApp, and Telegram, as well as on video platforms such as YouTube. In point of fact, the entire array of social media, from Facebook to TikTok, has made it easier for people reporting, including the press, to reach broader audiences much faster and much easier. This has not necessarily made it safer for reporters to report anonymously or otherwise on social media. Old and new threats still await them. Violence, intimidation, harassment of those reporting are unfortunately still persistent everywhere in spite of digital error. Yes, you have observed correctly that journalists are being harassed. And indeed, we have already received reports from the Uganda Human Rights Commission. We have read the reports from uh, the United Nations Human Rights Commission. We have read the reports. But I would like to say, as new players in the sector, we are now bringing the fourth estate closer to the ministry. Journalists are employees of the ministry, wherever they are. Every journalist is an employee of the ministry of ICT and national guidance. You are like advocates of court. You are employees of what? Of court. But I think there has been a disjoint between the ministry and the fourth estate. And the problem has mainly been lack of a uniting body for journalists. Because the Uganda Journalists Association has problems, and they originated from a case court. But we have taken time to resolve them. But recently we met all the communicators, the government communicators and the private communicators to see how we can revive Uganda Journalism Association so that we have a body that we can talk to. Otherwise the voices are scattered and therefore the ministry fails to get a united voice from the journalists. But as the Ministry of ICT and National Guidance, we are resolved and we are ready to advocate for your rights because that's what our mandate is all about. And please be in touch with us. That's why the minister made it a point that we get a representation here and in a position of a minister. Otherwise, we are supposed to have cabinet in Entebbe, but he had to tell me to come here to pass over this message so that we don't send anybody below a minister. And when a minister talks, then government has spoken. So be, be sure that we are ready to collaborate with you and to end this once and for all. When our rank as government reduces from 117 to 125, it's not you who is affected. It's we in the government who are affected. We would like even our rank to raise so that Uganda can be looked at as a free country where journalists are free to practice. So please don't think we love it. We don't. But we shall work together and sort out some of these issues. Uganda has a vibrant and progressive ICT space. 
Telecom companies have taken advantage of the conducive environment in which they operate to continuously invest in broadband and their internet technologies. With the more Ugandans using the internet, social media, social media use continues to increase. As such, the internet carries free expression, sometimes in the public interest to the people around Uganda and elsewhere in the world. In its 2013 Press Freedom in the Digital Age report, the Council of Europe noted that the internet enabled more and more people to become aware of corruption, maladministration, ethical behavior by public officials and businesses and serious human rights violation. And among the four disruptions we have in this country, one of them is corruption. And it's you, the fourth estate. And we call upon you to expose corruption as much as possible. Probably there, we shall also wake up as government to even fight it more. But there are so many institutions in place now that fight. But we can't be everywhere. And we can't get to the root of this. But strengthen your investigative journalism and expose corruption. Then government can come in to see how to deal with the corrupt. It added that this access to internet allow bloggers, reporting citizens and others to join traditional journalism in the ranks of those who are at risk of retaliation by the state authority or interest groups. In Uganda, the Ministry of ICT and National Guidance, working with the academia, civil society, as well as recognized bodies such as the National Association of Broadcasters, Public Relations Association of Uganda, and Uganda Journalists Association, is continually advocating for a realization of international acceptable minimum reporting standards. And I want to emphasize this acceptable minimum reporting standards because we may not reach the maximum. The ideal, the, the, the practical situation is normally not the ideal. Of course, like in all jurisdictions of the world, every once in a while, some individuals opt to use the power that social media grants them and infringe on the rights of those that they disagree with. Whereas you think government is high-handed, but even you journalists take it to the extreme and which is also not good. And just as I told you, everybody now in Uganda has become a what? A journalist of some sort. For instance, some individuals, in a bid to express their displeasure with our politics, has gained fame by notoriously and consistently attacking the persons of the first family. This is an ethical wrong, this is ethically wrong, and we must all condemn it. Whereas as government, we feel there are excesses. But even you here, you should condemn an ethical reporting. It is ethically wrong to attack the person of the president, to attack the person of the chairperson of the Uganda Human Rights Commission, because probably has not reported what you want, you start saying that one is also bold. After all, he was appointed by the regime. It is unethically not satisfactory. We shall fight, we shall streamline our side, but you also as journalists streamline your own side. It takes two to tango. So, 
we are misusing social media. Someone just goes on social media and says the president is dead. And, he, and even you, you circulate it. Uh, even when a journalist was with the president that real time on a function, none can come and say no, but we are here with him and we are on a function. So, as Minister of ICT and National Guidance, we want to fight this. We want to streamline our own systems. We are already engaging with state organs, but you should also streamline your own selves. And that's why we need a very strong association of journalists where we can reach them, interact with them, and see how everything is streamlined. In 2017, a missive to the Chiefs of Security, His Excellency the President Museveni, cautioned against torture of all starting, stating that the use of torture is unnecessary and wrong and must not be used again. So clearly then, our stance on torture is that harassment of journalists is primitive, barbaric, and unnecessary. Very primitive, harassing a journalist. It's, no, it's uncalled for. It's uncalled for. We shall look for other methods of handling wrong journalism but not torturing journalists. We have scientific means how we can control you. We can even block your phone, by the way, and you don't send anything. Scientifically, we can do it. So even if you go and get the wrong pictures, if we target you, we can block you. And you don't send that. So we don't need to torture you. That one, I think we condemn in the highest uh, terms possible. That one I would like to, to assure you. And we are saying all people involved in torture are doing it as individuals, as individuals, but not as state agents. And you should also know that even among journalists, there are those who are bad. And every time they release wrong information, the whole journalism fraternity is blamed. But we are saying we should get away from that and look for the wrong elements and get them out. And that's why I thank the Uganda Human Rights uh, Commission. Even when they are appointed by government, their reports are sometimes not favorable to <laughs> government. They criticize government. And that's what they're supposed to be. They're supposed to be independent. The United Nations uh, Human Rights Com Commission present here, they have written so many reports. And for us, that feedback is very important because it allows us to manage. You can't manage without such a type of feedback. Because for you, you go into details of this torture. And there, uh, I've told people there are some people who have been there and they have been compensated. But we don't want compensation because you can't compensate for pain. No, it's not possible. We want it to stop, but it needs a concerted effort. We recognize the critical importance of the press in the journey to further grow our democratic credence as a country. We recognize that the press is quite essential partner to our socio-economic transformation journey to build an independent, integrated, modern, and self-sustaining economy. Because right, right now we have the parish development model. We need journalists to highlight how it is going to operate. The more you write about it, the more it will be clear. So I invite you to join us in this fight against poverty. Join us so that we can fight poverty together. But I know you can only join us if we are friends. And I came here to, to extend a hand of friendship to all journalists. That the ministry is there for you 
and therefore you should come and you become friends so that you can highlight government programs, you can criticize positively, and we shall give that feedback will assist us to even improve the laws. Right now, we are trying to improve the laws. We are working on several amendments in the uh, Uganda Communication Act and all other acts in our ministry. We need your feedback so that we can see how we can make very strong laws. At the ministry, as the ministry in charge of ICT and national guidance, we will continue to work towards enabling an environment that first of all, encourage greater state and private investment in information technology. Secondly, we will continue to advocate and work with progressive agencies to guarantee the safety of members of the fourth estate. We have to guarantee your safety. A country without a strong fourth estate cannot develop at all. It is a closed country. It is a country in darkness. So let us work together. Our partnership and collaboration is not just a choice. It is a must. It's not a choice to collaborate with you, to partner with you. That collaboration and partnership is a must for us to develop our country. The right to receive and impact information is one we take seriously, and it is one of our mandates as Minister of ICT and National Guidance. I wish you very nice celebrations. You celebrate freely. You have seen there is no police here, so you can enjoy yourselves. <laughs> you will be here safely, and you should report everything that you will discuss here. We need that feedback. I thank you very much, and I say all this for God and my country. have greatly excited us. We wish uh, every government official was speaking like that, especially when you said uh, harassing journalists uh, is primitive and barbaric. You know, Martin Luther said it takes good people to keep quiet for evil to triumph in society. So if all of us can speak out against these barbaric acts, uh, the trend will certainly uh, change. Uh, right now, we are supposed to, I, I right now humbly request our special guests who are up here to go down and occupy the first seats on that first row. And then we have uh, the panelists taking up the, this table. My sister Tuhaise come and take over because you're supposed to moderate the next session. Honorable Minister, I hope we are with you the whole day because we have been stakeholders here with a number of proposals and uh, you the most important stakeholder that has to ensure that these proposals are worked on. Half day. Of course, it's half day. It's not whole day. We are here half day. By, by around mid. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, my brother Moses, for peacefully handing over. Sometimes it becomes a little bit hard to take over peacefully. But uh, I'll, 
I'll just have my mask off just a little bit. And I'll start off by saying to all my colleagues, to all the journalists, a happy World Press Freedom Day to you. For those supporting all the effort, for all those who wake up early in the morning and all you're thinking about is what next am I going to be able to tell the countrymen, the people who are watching. I want to say a happy World Press Freedom Day to you again and all the aspiring journalists. It's not an easy trade, like the minister did particularly say, but uh, like he said, that collaboration and partnership is not just a choice, it's actually a must. And I think that's what Her Excellency uh, Susan Ngongi did speak about as well, that there needs to be continuous collaboration and we need to continuously speak. And it was with great pleasure when um, Mr. Robert Kochani did clearly say that he is willing and the UN system is definitely ready to facilitate those conversations um, with the security personnel, but even the conversations just within the media cells. Um, when the minister, um, Honorable, did clearly speak about a unifying factor, I, I, I think you're clearly speaking to um, the reality that sometimes you need a uniting voice. You need one full force that you know if I speak to, I am able to meet each and every one as opposed to when you have a, a, a little bit of splinters. It is okay to have different groups, but do we have that one unifying voice that can be able to share all this? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be taking on our discussion. Uh, my name is Mildred Tohaise. I work with Next Media Services, particularly NBS TV, and I'm glad uh, to take on this next session on a day that is supposed to be ours. I would have expected that we take off rest, but then the question is, who will be reporting the news if all the journalists Let's go on a little bit of a holiday, so it's a 24-7 job. But before we take on the discussion, which is going to focus particularly on the digital siege, which the minister highlighted, Her Excellency highlighted, uh, the UN, uh, I mean the Uganda Human Rights Commission uh, head highlighted, and everyone else, the digital space. The reality that we are having currently in the third industrial revolution, which particularly focuses on the digital revolution, but the fact that we are also dri uh, driving into or already into the fourth industrial revolution, it is no longer business as usual. That is the reality. On the digital space right now, which is clearly, steadily um, disorganizing the traditional media, there is the discussion about speed versus accuracy. Who is reporting what and in what particular way is it being reported? You know, the minister was speaking about bloggers and all these people. This is the new reality that now the word media, which is a plural for medium, is, is broader. For someone who is operating on, uh, on YouTube, that's a medium of exchange, of information. For someone who is blogging, it's a medium, and it all constitutes media. And that is where we bring in the discussion of what is now the definition of journalism. Journalism. Who is a journalist in this day and age? So who is a journalist? What is journalism in this day and age where we do have a digital journalist, where we do have citizen journalism, whereby my phone can as well substitute his camera. So how do we handle the journalism in essence, that journalism uh, in class which taught us the four W's and H in this space? Because um, the minister was speaking about professionalism. Very, very true. But how do we manage to live in that particular space? Before I call upon our panelists and discussants, uh, we will be getting more of uh, a keynote address uh, or presentation from Ms. Rose Mary Kemigisha, who is a senior human uh, rights officer at the Uganda Human Rights Commission. And uh, Ms. Rose, kindly uh, step to the fore. We'll be listening from you first. And, and as Ms. Rose comes, ladies and gentlemen, also allow me to invite uh, Jean, uh, Jean Annette Ajuang uh, from Media Focus Africa. But I think we will also be having a rep that representation from um, one of my sisters here, Charity Ahimbisiwe, at Ant Charity, kindly allow, please step to the fore. We will be having this particular discussion with you. Um, we were also supposed to have Karo Beyanga, the head of mentorship partnerships and monetization. Uh, 
Monitor Publications Limited. That's from Nation Media Group. Caro, please step to the fore. It's a pleasure having you. And um, Dr. Adolf Mbaine is going to be represented by my sister Charity Ahimbisiwe right here. But we will also be having uh, Moses Molondo back, uh, please, from the Uganda Parliamentary Press Association. I will request you to step back to uh, the front table. And before we take this on, uh, please, Miss Rosemary, take the lead and uh, bring us to speed with your presentation, what it feels like commemorating. For me, I never say it's a celebration because really there is just a lot more that ought to be achieved. But uh, it is a commemoration, like uh, Her Excellency uh, Susan did say, that um, the steps that have been taken since 1993, the steps that have been taken. Yes, we're not where we wish to be or where we want to be, but we're not where we were in the past when nothing really was being talked about, the media and press freedom. So uh, you can feel free to take to the podium. Thank you very much, Mildred. Uh, it is still good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Happy celebrations of World Press Freedom Day. I was asked to uh, make a presentation on the human rights perspective of the, uh, uh, the theme for World Press Freedom Day which is journalism and a digital stage. Well, uh, as a way of introduction, I think journalism is here to stay. The threat is there. Uh, we will, right from here, find a way of existing in the new digital space. But the role of journalism, the role of journalists uh, cannot be uh, really wished away. Now, as a way of introduction, and, and I'm giving an overview of the human rights issues in this subject, uh, and I'm hoping that my colleagues on the panel will bring life uh, to my theories so that we can have uh, practical and concrete resolutions from this discussion. Now, the, the importance of journalism to human rights, particularly freedom of speech and expression and the right to information is very, very crucial. Journalists don't exist uh, as an end, or journalism doesn't exist as an end in itself. Journalism serves a purpose which is for the wider good of all citizens. Just like she explained earlier, media. Journalism is a medium through which citizens get empowered. So uh, I always tell media people that they shouldn't be uh, so arrogant or so full of themselves. They are just helping, they are enabling all the citizens, including ourselves, to enjoy our freedom of expression, to enjoy our right to information. So we need to be humble and understand that we exist because the public exists. 
We exist because the public needs to enjoy its freedom of expression and freedom and right to information. Now, the, the, the right to freedom of expression means freedom to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media of choice. That is why the coming, in, uh, the coming of the digital spaces, I think, should not be <coughs> should not be such a big threat. If we truly appreciate, okay, now I'm saying we because I'm also a journalist. <laughs> If we truly appreciate the role we play in this whole scenario, because the freedom is extended to all other media. And our constitution specifically states uh, that everyone has a right to freedom of speech and expression, which shall include freedom of the press and other media. So we can't say we own the space. Let the people come. But when they come, what happens to us? We have to up our game. We have to prove that journalism uh, is important. That journalism is not just about uh, a conduit for information. Journalism, in, from a human rights perspective, is about uh, providing empowering information to the citizens so that they can uh, use that information to also play their roles as citizens, to participate in governance, to participate in decision making, to participate in development, in nation building, name it. Okay, so professional journalism is going to remain relevant. I am not going to belabor uh, the role of journalism, which I have uh, talked about. But let me just say that good journalism requires free and independent media, requires freedom of the press and other media, which is part and parcel of freedom of speech of everyone else and expression. It requires professionalism and compliance with ethical courts. It requires the necessary infrastructure and tools. It requires that the limitations and regulations are designed to enhance its enjoyment rather than stifling the enjoyment of that right. And ultimately, all this contributes to democracy, development, the ultimate national good. So if your journalism stops on the way and you are not contributing to empowering citizens, then we have to pull up our socks. Um, information must be empowering uh, because people have to know their rights and responsibilities. They have to recognize and report potential human rights violations and corruption. They have to make informed decisions. They have to effectively monitor and hold duty bearers accountable. You cannot hold duty bearers accountable unless you have information, unless you have the accurate information. They have to participate in decision making, in elections, in service delivery, in the parish development model the Honorable Minister was talking about. They need that empowering information. But if that information is missing, then you have a disempowered citizenry. And that disempowered citizenry is prone to the avalanche of information that we are talking about, that we are afraid of. If we don't provide the empowering information, the information gap will be filled 
by the new journalists that we have been talking about. Uh, when, the, when there is lack of information, there is vulnerability, which I've just been explaining. And of course, that also makes us prone to human rights violations. So there must be a deliberate effort to ensure that the information we provide is empowering to the citizens so that they can enjoy or exercise their rights. Now, I'm not going to belabor the digital siege, uh, but what I can say is that computer technology has made it possible to digitize almost everything, and the ability to produce, process, share, and transfer information in all areas of life is unprecedented because of the speed at which this whole information thing has been transformed. Now, there is fear, which has been expressed here, that the potential brought by that speed and reach and the complexity of the internet can be exploited for harmful purposes. And indeed, we have seen it. I don't know how many times uh, you have encountered corn men, and I don't know whether they are corn women, corn men on the internet taking advantage of digital spaces. Now, there is need to ad address the prevention of cyber crime, the security of personal information, and also the limits of freedom of expression. Now, there are also positive uh, consequences of this. I mean, uh, when the internet was shut down during elections, uh, media people suffered. They couldn't do live broadcasts. Uh, they had to transport recorded stories by bus from the field to their newsrooms. So uh, 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 if the internet is on, we can also thrive. We can take advantage of the digital spaces to better our role as journalists. Now, um, I would like to raise a few human rights issues in this whole picture that we really need to be mindful of even in this discussion, even in decisions, uh, even in policies and legislation and whatever actions that will be taken. Number one is that human rights and freedoms must be guaranteed in a digital space as much as they are offline. So there is no difference between my entitlement to my rights as a citizen, whether I'm on the internet or I, whether I am not. So the state still maintains the responsibility, the obligation to respect those rights in the digital space, to protect those rights, and protection means you prevent third parties from violating those rights. The state itself doesn't violate, but it also prevents third parties, like the owners of our media platforms, from violating our own rights. Uh, it also means that the state's obligation to fulfill still remains, and that is putting in place a conducive environment, policy, legal, judicial, administrative environment, for protection and promotion of human rights. Now, the Constitution of Uganda is very good. Honorable Minister, it guarantees all these things. But there is a gap between the guarantees and the implementation on the ground, which we seek to address. The second human rights issue is that all human rights and freedoms go hand in hand with duties and responsibilities. 
And as a matter of fact, from the onset, even the international instrument that guarantees freedom of expression, freedom of the media, Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, ascribed duties to people enjoying that freedom of expression. There is a duty that prohib prohibits propaganda for war, inciting violence, advocating hatred, and incitement to cause harm. Most of the rights are stated, everyone has a right to this and this and this. But this particular right that gives media uh, freedom also stated responsibilities in that, uh, in that same instrument, which means that there is a very high responsibility on the media, very high responsibility on journalism, uh, and that responsibility is not going to go away in the digital era. The question we have, the critical question, is how do we enforce this responsibility in the digital era? The third human rights issue is that human rights, particularly the rights we are talking about, freedom of expression, freedom of the media, the right to information, are not absolute. They can be limited. So even in digital spaces, those rights can be limited. But they must also follow the accepted principles of limiting human rights. Honorable Minister, when we are thinking of regulation, when we are thinking of legislation, when we are thinking of policy, we need to be mindful that the limitations on the rights must be for purposes of enhancing enjoyment of that right, but not to stifle the right. And therefore, uh, we need the limitations because we have to safeguard other rights. We need the limitations, but the limitations must be legal. The principles for limitations are legality, uh, necessity, proportionality, non-discrimination, and they must be justifiable and necessary in a democratic society. So arbitrary limitations, which we all experience in the field, when a security personnel uh, descends on a journalist and clobbers the journalist without putting them through due process, that is a, an illegal limitation to the right. Now, this is the test to which all media regulation should be subjected to. That, br that brings me to the internet shutdowns. Well, government explained why they shut down the internet, but it was like using a hammer to kill a mosquito. Because the internet was not just being used by the few people that were abusing it as far as government is concerned. The internet shutdown was an excessive, perhaps an excessive limitation because there was too much collateral damage in the internet shutdown, including life. So as we think of limiting these, uh, 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 these freedoms, let us think of the principles of limitation. Let us not stifle the rights themselves. The other human rights issue is that professional journalism and human rights have a symbiotic relationship. Professional journalism is a right in itself but it also enables realization of human rights. So you can't, you can't really separate the two. And the codes of ethics for journalists are the duties and responsibilities of the journalists which come with media freedom. So I also challenge my colleagues 
that uh, uh, media, media freedom must be exercised within certain responsibilities. Now, journalists are human rights defenders and they deserve special protection even in digital spaces. Uh, there is a framework for protection of human rights defenders, so we need to have journalists also take advantage of that protection because they indeed are human rights defenders. Now, that requires being part of the strong solidarity and alliances for human rights defenders so that we can have strength in numbers and voice. Uh, I already said this should be the last human rights issue that I can discuss. I already talked about it, that journalists bear the wider citizens' freedom of speech and expression, and therefore there is need for the public to appreciate and defend the media rights. The policeman who is kicking you does not know that you are speaking for him or herself, okay? So how do we endeavor to ensure that the public can support us, that the public can understand and appreciate that the journalism is for their own public good. Journalism helps the public. So that if Honorable Minister shuts down a radio station, we can have the public go on the street to demonstrate that we need that radio station back. Because they feel, they feel the contribution of journalism to their own uh, realization of human rights. So that link is missing, and I hope that uh, in our discussions we can find a way of rallying the public uh, uh, around journalism so that they can also, we can also get public defense in case journalism is attacked. I have, an, I have a number of recommendations, but I will say just a few. Uh, I think the positive, the positive uh, impacts of digitization should also be exploited to promote human rights, to promote media rights, to promote accountability. Let us take advantage of these platforms of the speed of information so that we can uh, uh, promote rights. Let's not just lament that it has come to squeeze us out of space, but let's grab also the opportunity to enhance our work. And we need to apply the human rights-based approach, uh, whether it is in regulation, whether it is in our work, whether it is, and that is something that the Human Rights Commission advocates for. Uh, and we also need to bear in mind the principle of indivisibility of human rights. You, all human rights are equal. You can't say, I will give you this, but I will not give you that one. Because the human being is a package, needs the entire package of human rights to live in dignity. So it is important if, you, if, if a security officer violates a journalist, there are many other rights that will be affected. But likewise, if there is an effort to enhance a human right, then it can also uplift, it can also uh, by default uplift all other human rights. So one action can actually result in, in many benefits as, as far as human rights is concerned. Um, duty bearers, both state and proprietors, need to ensure that technological advances are always, always underpinned by respect for the freedom, privacy, and security of journalists. We are talking about the whole range of, uh, of uh, duty bearers, including policymakers, legislators, 
the judiciary, the enforcers and implementers, they need to uh, ensure that respect for freedom, privacy, and safety of journalists is key, even in digital spaces. Um, let's use the technology to harness public support for media work. Let us set up and join protection networks, like I've already told, said, our own networks as journalists, but also networks of HRDs, human rights defenders. Let us also organize. We have a problem of self-organization in the industry. The minister, Honorable Minister talked about it. It is important that we speak with one voice. And the public should be sensitized. Media literacy is a must. The public should be sensitized, uh, particularly on the importance of journalism to enjoyment of their own human rights. Honorable Minister, we need adequate investment in media infrastructure across the country the availability and access to the internet. There's no reason, if we are in this digital era, why, for example, one part of Uganda, which is in the city, can easily access internet and others cannot, because that means some people are missing out. Even journalists, journalists who work up country, they will need the same access and availability of internet for them to work like the others. Um, we need to redefine minimum standards for media content for all the players, not just journalists. Minimum standards for media content. We have a lot of people now in the digital space, so we can't throw them out, but we need to embrace them and groom them so that they can understand the responsibility of using the media space. Uh, Mildred is not, is eyeing me, so let me just conclude by saying the digital revolution is here with us. It has ramifications for journalism. So we, we, we've got to rethink and review how to protect the important role of the media because journalism will have to survive and also thrive in the digital era. Thank you for your kind attention. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rosemary. That was very elaborate, and uh, we could as well go on and on and on throughout. But uh, our time is really fast spent, yet we need to have this panel as, as big as it is. I think now with the coming in of Adolf, we are trying to, Mr. I mean, Dr. Adolf, we are trying to balance up a little bit. I earlier on wanted to brag that uh, we had 90% female, you know, representation right here on the panel. But I think we'll go straight, and this will not just be on the panel that is right here, but uh, we will expect that we will have a bit of um, context coming in from the, the players that are in the audience. But let me start with my uh, my senior colleague, uh, Madame Kara Beyanga, on the issue of um, the human rights situation in Uganda. And you know, many times when you talk about the human rights situation, we are probably looking at the offline mode. And, and I love that in this case, we are also looking at the online mode where there are also numerous human rights violations that have come through. So what situation do you envisage or that you've seen or paid attention to in the recent past? And, and what is, is, is causing it? For example, in the offline mode, uh, some of these officers say, we asked the media not to cross the line and they came through, you know, so they will blame it on the media. And, and, and then the, a journalist is probably posting something on Twitter and uh, 
um, they're asking uh, that they pull that down. Why? Because they feel it's very sensitive information. And this journalist is also saying, but I am a journalist. I have to share information. So looking at that context, uh, where are we in terms of the human rights situation? Thank you, Mildred, and good, af good, afternoon. Is it afternoon? Yeah. good afternoon to everyone. Um, thank you for being part of this discussion. I, I would say that the, the situation of human rights in Uganda, it's fluid, uh, in my view. It's, it moves up and down. Uh, at some point, it is, you know, at some points, it seems like we have some human rights being, you know, respected. Other points, it seems not. And um, it, it depends on the situation in the country. You find that when we, when there are matters of interest to the people that the government is also interested in, for example, the situation will be fine. You know, the, the journalists will have the right to report, there will be, people will come out to speak. But when, for example, the government feels targeted, then the, 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 the right starts to, um, if I may choose, you know, sort of, sort of starts to dip. So the situation tends to be fluid. It depends on what is, uh, what is being spoken about. It depends on the season in the country. As we all know, when it's election time, again, that is very fluid. There is uh, lots of restrictions. There is lots of demands from uh, different, uh, you know, uh, whether it's political parties themselves, whether it is the government themselves. So, uh, and then when it comes to online, Mildred, um, I would say the situation is even worse because I think many people are not uh, aware of what the human rights are when it comes to online. There's a lot of ignorance. Uh, many people uh, demand their rights but do not, do not carry the responsibility like uh, Rosemary was saying. So th there's a lot of ignorance and so that creates a, a very vol volatile situation where there's a lot of abuse of rights, there's a lot of uh, people do not know what they're supposed to be doing, people are not aware of where they're crossing the line and because people are not aware, they are not, there's also no, how can I say, it? you find that when people sort of abuse rights to an extent offline, they are, there are consequences. Online, the consequences are fewer, or they are not as heavy. So that yeah, online tends to be worse. So I would say the situation really is fluid, depending on the situation in the country, depending on what is happening, and depending on who is being targeted or spoken about. All right, thank you. And let me cross over to doctor at the extreme end. Uh, while in journalism um, school, there is a lot that is taught what to expect the rights and responsibilities and what's expected of each and every journalist. But um, the question would be, a journalist, are we overly exaggerating our, our role? Because, and, and I'm, I'm trying to put that in context, where journalists feel like, yes, I am supposed to be there. And that brings in the discussion of th that ambiguity of what are the rights? What, what are my rights? What are my responsibilities? And I want you to put that in the context of both the offline and online uh, in the discussion that I brought about of, I have come to cover the news. It's a riot. Yes, I need to capture that moment. And you as a police officer are telling me to go aside. You're doing your job. I'm doing mine. And you've seen journalists do that as much. I am doing my job. And the officer is also saying, I am doing my job. And before you know it, there is a sort of a clash. Uh, bring that into context. Uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry I arrived a bit late. I was in another meeting and uh, it went on and on and on. So I'm sorry, Honorable Minister and uh, uh, the Honorable Chair of the Commission and uh, our friend, our good friend, the resident representative of human rights and colleagues. Um, yeah, I think uh, there is a problem around the understanding of uh, free expression in the broader context and media freedom as such. And I think once we don't get that right, then we, we depart from uh, the wrong premise. Um, we, we probably all know the importance of free expression for all of us. Um, we can, freedom of expression is so important that I think we cannot even enjoy other freedoms if we don't have freedom of expression. Now, there is also a misunderstanding about freedom of the media. Um, I think a lot of people think that freedom of the media is just about the freedom of journalists to do what they do best. Um, I come from a school of thought which agrees 
that freedom of the media is actually a citizen's right in the first place. It's only that journalists do this as a daily routine. Uh, and so uh, defending freedom of the media is really defending uh, the, the freedom of citizens to free to information, the information they need to get along with their lives. Now, the, the, there is always a bit of a problem around understanding the roles of the media by different actors. Uh, wh wh what does this uh, police officer or security officer stationed somewhere understand the role of the media to be? Once, once this person does not understand broadly that the media is important and necessary for certain functions, then of course you are going to have the kind of situations that we get around here. Um, it is true that in trading in information, uh, one is bound to step on people's doors and, and so on, commit errors and so forth and so on. But once, uh, but once the crucial role of the journalist and editor and broadcaster and publisher are well understood and appreciated, then even those shortcomings will, will be dealt with in a certain way that protects the core values around uh, this function. Uh, I also need to say that the digital age has brought its has brought with it several benefits but also several challenges and we are also dealing in this era with the age of my information disinformation and misinformation uh, which i'm sure all of us have an idea about and uh, so the issue of journalistic accountability or accountability for anybody actually trading in information has come to the center and we need to deal with this challenge and that's why you are talking about issue ethics and so on and so forth for me ethics are, are just a, a road or avenue towards accountability who are you accountable for in what you are doing yeah. and this is very important but i think i think that we need to get I, 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 need, I think that we need some kind of uh, more, inf more effort towards media literacy for a lot of our people, right. including the people who handle journalists and the media generally, yes. um, both within and from outside. What, what does the media exist for? How is it important for society? What roles should they play? And how should we deal with them when there are challenges okay. uh, either internal to the media or exterior to the media? Yes. I think that is where we need to start from. And uh, um, if, of course, within the broader context of freedom of the citizens, rights of the citizens, and, uh, and related matters. I also want to say, since I have this opportunity and the Honourable Minister is here, that we, we, we really need to work towards a, <laughs> a, a politically more open, and a tolerant society. Okay. That is vital for the enjoyment of human rights and freedoms. The, chair, the, the Honorable uh, Chairperson of the Uganda Human Rights Commission is here. I have seen a couple, I mean, several of their reports over the years, and the theme and the, the, the issues they raise are serious. <coughs> Most of them have not been actually addressed over the years, and what this means is that almost every year we probably get worse from the previous years in terms of political tolerance, in terms of respect for human rights and freedoms. Okay. I thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. I would have expected when Doctor spoke about a politically tolerant society, the journalists to clap their hands because that seems to be one of the biggest hindrances here. Let me let me come to you, uh, Mr. Mlondo. And um, on, on the 
aspect of uh, freedom of expression, which Rosemary also talked about, and, and talked about three facets which I was pretty much interested in. Uh, seeking, receiving, and imparting ideas. And part of these ideas are information. And, and, and looking at you, for example, at uh, the Uganda Parliamentary Press Association, would say that's more of the library of information that we would need if there are legislations, if there are laws, if there are discussions that are being uh, done right there. And, and for me, the biggest asset for a journalist is not this microphone or the camera, but the information that you're going to be able to process and give out. What challenges are you facing there in, or are journalists facing there in? Also security challenges, because there is information that you will get and you'll receive one phone call, and you asked, you either use or don't use that information, it is up to you. So I want you to put in context the, the security challenges, which later on violate you know, personal liberties and freedom of expression, that you're typing something on Twitter and you think twice and you're like, even when you know it's true, you censor yourself and say delete. Okay, thank you very much. Actually, I, before I, I, I start my response, I want to agree with uh, Dr. Mbaine on the issue of the political environment. Um, one American scholar, uh, Christopher Dodi, said when press freedom is, is endangered, all the other liberties, all the other freedoms that uh, are important uh, will be endangered. So one of the biggest challenges that we have in the country is the quality of our democracy. I was attending the launch of the report of the Press Freedom Index by the Human Rights Network for Journalists and the number of journalists who are, who are victims that had been assaulted when they turned up and they were giving their accounts. Most of them actually were assaulted while covering mostly opposition um, political activities, especially Robert Chagulani. So you can see that actually that is where the biggest problem is. And um, we, we are lucky that today we are having that discussion.